audiobook, Simply This Moment. 20 The Ending of Everything, 2. 7th of December 2005. The Janas are the first state of disappearance. It's tough to allow things to disappear. People just don't want to let go of their bodies, thoughts, or hearing. Why is it that? Sound disturbs you in meditation? As a John Cha famously said, sound does not disturb anyone, you disturb the sound. That's a powerful teaching. What it means is that the self wants to hear and that's why it literally goes out and looks for sounds. The mind wants to have a body to cling onto and that's why it looks for feelings in the body and won't allow this body to disappear. The mind gets attached even to the breathing and that's why it won't let the breath disappear and vanish. As soon as the breath vanishes you think, ah, I'm not breathing, and you want to breathe again. Even when nothing is happening and you get into a sense of stillness, the mind freaks out. You think if nothing is happening it means that you are about to disappear. This is the fear, the movement, the trembling, that causes the five senses start again and this body to exist. It is the attachment of this mind to the body, the delusion that this is mine, and if I let these things go, ah, what will happen? It's fear of the Dhamma or fear of meditation. Samatha gets you past these attachments through two causes, either through understanding or through the sheer pleasure of it. The understanding allows you to see that there is no one here, so you just let go naturally. The pleasure, the bliss of the deep meditations, can be so peaceful that, even though you don't agree with this, even though it doesn't make sense, even though it scares the shit out of you the attachments don't matter, it's just too joyful and too blissful, so you just go right through. This is actually where the mind can disengage from the body. When the mind disengages from the body, the body disappears. That's called jhana. When I say it disappears, I mean not just the body but also the echoes of the body, the echoes of the five senses. Things like space and time are all connected to this body. The body moves and thus creates space, time. The mind moves because of craving. Craving, craving for something in this five sense world. You're disturbed by sound. Because you are interested in sound, you are actually attached to hearing, that's all it is. You're attached to feeling, to the body, you're attached to the breath. You see, these things disappear, you've samitha at them. At last you don't have a body, you can't feel it, it's gone. You can't hear sound, and you can't even think. The mind has become so still. Its ability to control the world through thought has disappeared and vanished. You've samitha ed it. When you've samitha ed it, the body vanishes from your existence. Samitha ed means that it has niroda ed temporarily, it's gone. People say, but it's still there. That's not the point. If you are not observing it, it's gone. That's basic quantum theory if you want to be scientific about it. You need an observer to create reality. That's the experience you have in the deep meditations. The body simply is not there and you don't give a damn about it. If you can achieve that state, you know that body contemplation has done its work. Its purpose is to let go, to allow things to vanish, to see a world, comma loka, disappear. You've heard me say. Before that it's very important to experience things vanishing and disappearing. To understand this, the best simile is the simile of the tadpole leaving the water as a frog. Only when the tadpole has left the water as a frog can it really know what water is. Before then it may have had theories about water, it may have heard about water. From this monk or that monk or this groba ajan or that book or whatever, but it will not know what water is. When the tadpole becomes a frog and leaves the water, it knows from its own experience, not just from beliefs or theories. It now sees what 
It's like when there is no water left. It's a powerful insight which changes the whole way the frog looks at life. This is what happens when you gain the jhanas. You've Samitha ed the body and the five senses and they've disappeared. You know what? Naroda means now, you know what the body is. You won't understand the body by just contemplating it up and down if it hasn't yet disappeared, all you will know are the changes of the body, not the essence of a body. In the same way the tadpole might know the colors in the water and might know the cold or the heat in the water, but it won't know the essence of the water until it's disappeared. Body contemplation reaches its fulfillment when the body disappears, that's its job. Its purpose is to get you into jhanas, nothing more than that. When the jhanas happen, then you will have an opportunity of knowing what the body is and what the five senses are. Before that it's just theory and beliefs, it's not substantial, and it will never get you anywhere. It will just make you argue more with other people. That's what is meant by being attached to views not experience. When you get into jhanas, they will be the foundation that gives you the data for enlightening insight. At least, you've known that what arose from a cause has now ceased. The body has gone, you understand that. That is how the Buddha taught, and you gain incredible faith in the teachings of the Buddha, faith based on your own experience. When you see your mind disappear you understand what the teachings really mean. You understand that. The whole purpose of going through the jhanas and the arupa, immaterial, attainments, is to see the whole world of the mind disappear. In the medieval period of Christianity, long after the time of the Buddha, some of the Christian ascetics started to talk about union with God. What does that mean? If any of you experience a first jhana you'll understand what that means. Many of us were brought up in a Christian tradition and can look at the experience of a first jhana and understand why anyone from that Christian tradition would interpret and perceive that as union with God. That union is Akata, the oneness of mind. The God perception is the incredible Padishaka of that state, the incredible power and bliss. I remember as a young man how I used to go to rock concerts. There was this guy called Eric Clapton playing for the Queen. People would shout, he's God. Eric Clapton is God. He's God. He's God. The reason they would say that is because they developed incredible bliss. You can really get high on that music. This is an example. That God is what gives you enormous happiness and power. It's very easy to see. Why Christians and even Hindus take those experiences as ultimate reality, the same consciousness, unchanging, and pure and blissful. If you experience those states and you know them from your own experience, you'll also understand why those states that occur just before the jhanas were called Pabasara Siddha by the Buddha. The five hindrances have been overcome and the mind is incredibly radiant. That's the nimitta, brilliant and bright. You may even apply that description to the first jhana. You still have a bit of a wobble there, enough to see or get a handle on the mind state, on the object of your mind in that experience. And it is pabasara, very bright, radiant, for sure, powerful and pure. The great thing about these experiences is that when you come out of the meditation you are able to Understand the framework of the incredible teachings of the suttas. You understand that the Pabasara Siddha, so pure, so still, so powerful, is also subject to change. It arises from a cause and is subject to an ending. People who don't understand that dash, like the Christians, will take those experiences to be the ultimate. This is where people get the mistaken idea of a persisting consciousness. They have the experience of those jhanas, but they do not have enough understanding of the Dhamma to really penetrate and understand that this too will pass, that this too is a causal thing, this too 
is just made up of elements which are of the nature to cease. Ye damahatu pabavatasahatyatathagato ahatasan ca yondaridho, the first. Lines of Venerable Asajji's statement, all those damas that are of the nature to arise, or come into being, the Buddha taught their cause and he taught their ending. Their cessation, their going out of existence. In jhanas you have the experience of things ending, of the five sense world and thoughts ending. You understand what the dhamma is. One of the greatest experiences from calming down during the jhanas is the ending of will. What a powerful experience that is, to see that this part of the mind that has always been there, the potential to will, to choose, to argue, to make your own decisions, to move the mind whichever way you want, that potential which creates the words that come out of your mouth, which creates the movement of the body, which is the driving force of your life, that whole movement that is so essential to your perception of a self-completely disappears. Will goes when you see that happening. You can never again think that an era and after Pirani Bana can move to do anything. Doing is suffering, moving, speaking, going, coming, and all trembling is suffering. I don't mean trembling out of fear, I mean the trembling that moves you out of stillness, out of this wonderful nothingness, that is suffering, Dukkha. When you see in this way that all the arising of comings and goings and speech or whatever is all suffering, it is because you've experienced the second jhana. You'll know for sure what the end is, it's the end of will, the end of craving, the end of doing things. Means that the world stops. Not just the external world but also the internal world. The mind stops. The mind is that which moves, it is the house builder. The mind creates, this is what it does. Sometimes we know things for what they are. Sometimes we know things by their function and that is what the mind does. In Pali, Siddha, mind, also means, variegation, color, and beauty. It creates this world of beauty. It's interesting to understand and get to the heart of the way words are used. In Pali, the original meaning of the word often reveals some deeper facets of what the word truly means. When the mind stops willing, when it stops moving, well then the mind starts to disappear. The second jhana is in one sense a very powerful turning point in the mind, because will has stopped, nothing is moving. After a time the second jhana settles down into the third jhana and the third jhana settles down into the Fourth jhana. Things change as the whole world starts to vanish, and space vanishes. The first arupa jhana is the perception of infinite space. In the second arupa jhana, space vanishes. How do these things happen? It's just that the whole concept of space has no meaning anymore. The idea of a mind or body in some sort of space has no meaning anymore because the mind is still in the equanimity of the fourth jhana, and is completely one-pointed, that concept vanishes. All that is left is consciousness. That consciousness has no bounds, no limits, and is infinite and nothing at the same moment, which is a sign that consciousness itself is on the edge of extinction. As consciousness extinguishes there is nothing left. The mind knows nothing which is why the third arupa jhana is called the perception of nothingness. At this point the siddha is vanishing. You experience this. It is no longer a theory that you argue about, you experience it from your own meditation. When you come out of that state afterwards you can see so clearly. The frog is now not just out of the pond onto the dry land, but it's jumping up into the air. Even the land is disappearing. With the consciousness disappearing you perceive nothing, because you perceive nothing, perception is dying. You can't watch nothing for too long before perception turns off. When you perceive the end of perception, this is what is meant by the state of neither perception nor non-perception. You perceive the 
ending of perception that's why it's called non-perception. It just depends on what angle you look at it from. When you perceive the ending of perception, perception finally ends and the mind is gone, deceased, ended, poof, gone. You understand that all these dhammas which arose from a cause now end in cessation. You understand those words of an asajita saraputta and why saraputta. Understood it straight away. Ye can see samudaya dhamma, all these things that come from a cause, subhadanero da dhamma, must one day cease. One day, sooner or later, it must happen. It's that acceptance and embracing of the possibility of cessation which shows that there is an ending and which makes nibbana possible. Like the shipwrecked sailor floating on the surface of the water, you can see dry land. The only place where you can be saved. Whenever there is movement, doing, speaking and existing, there is suffering. The Buddha said that even a small amount of shit on your finger stinks. In the same way just a small amount of existing is suffering, everything should be abandoned, should be let go of. When one understands this one understands the path to liberation, to freedom. Anyone who resists this sort of teaching and wants to keep something somewhere, a last piece of gamma, a last piece of being, whether you call it merging with God, original consciousness, original mind, or whatever, and I don't care what any other person says, that is delusion, wrong view. When you see things ceasing, you see much deeper than that. You see the ending of things and the ending of things is the most beautiful experience. You can't get better or further than nothing. Wherever there is something left, there is something more to do, something more to samatha, something more to bring to complete cessation and freedom. The reason people can't let go of the body is the same reason they can't let go of their minds, attachment, clinging. They want to find some little corner of Scissor for existence where they can still become enlightened, enjoy it forever and come back to teach other people about it. That is wrong view. It's almost the same as the Mahayana concept about being a bodhisattva and always being able to come back again to help other people. That's completely missing the point. The point is cessation, niroda, nibbana the ending of things, the complete samatha of the whole universe, of existence. The Buddha found that out, and he said it was hard to see beings in this world, caught up in clinging and attachment, being able to see this deep teaching. It's true that sometimes we are not courageous enough. Sometimes we believe others too much, instead of suspending all of those views and just trusting in the suttas. Stop messing around. Get into the jhanas, the real jhanas, not the fake ones. Even today there are many people who go around teaching and they know that the jhanas are important, but because they have not had that experience themselves, they are dumbing down the jhana states of mind. States that are less than the full attainments are being called jhanas. The argument about the importance of jhanas has been won at last. Even in the United States, talking with people like Jack Kaernfield and Joseph Goldstein, I think that they now understand that you have to get into jhanas to get anywhere with your insight practice. So when I met them they were pumping me for information about the jhanas. I have taught jhanas over all these years, keeping a consistent standard for what they are, never wavering in my description of them explaining them again and again, and putting them in the context of the Dhamma. I have explained what they are for and why they are important. I have explained how they lead to the ending of all things, to Samatha, bliss, and peace. Anukavata Saskara, impermanent are all these things. Apadavaya Dhammina, even the Siddha will cease, Tesavapasamo Sako, there. Coming is happiness. Vapasama is the same as Samatha, the coming of all these things, the body, the mind, consciousness, perception, 
and will. When everything stops, vanishes, ceases, Samitha, Naroda, this is happiness, this is bliss. The reason they can cease is because there was nothing there to begin with. As the Buddha often said in the suttas, can the Tathagata be regarded as any of the five khandas or as the five khandas altogether? Can you see a Tathagata apart from the five khandas? The Buddha said, no, you can't. The Tathagata or Buddha is neither separate from the five khandas, nor in the five khandas. You can't see him anywhere. That's why you can't talk about a Tathagata after Panibbana. Anyone who starts to talk about anything existing or being after Parinibbana has missed the point. When you develop the deep meditations, the jhanas, again and again and again, when you look upon them with your own wisdom, challenging every view, challenging whatever you have heard from any teacher, you will see just an incredible emptiness of both body and mind and the whole universe. You see that because of that, it can finish, it can end. You see what a scientist sees, the complete emptiness of the material which makes up this cosmos, this universe of solar systems and planets and monasteries and whatever else. You can see it as all empty. All that is left is consciousness. You see this physical world as empty and you know how it came out of emptiness. It arose because of a cause which means that one day this whole universe will vanish in the same way. This mind comes from a cause and one day it too will vanish, but unlike the physical universe, it does not re-arise. Most minds take a long time, but as soon as you see the Dhamma and become an errant, you know why this mind will vanish after Panibbana. It says in the Theragata, your mind will surely vanish. Purbhavati, Thag, 1144, will disappear, Vitamasati, Thag, 184. I like to translate that as will be destroyed. Why? Because the cause, the craving to be, has been destroyed. All those three cravings Kamataha, Vibhavataha, and Bhavataha have been destroyed. Craving for sensory pleasure is what drives worldlings. The craving to be is what drives monks. In the end all cravings, including the craving to destroy things, are nothing more than the craving to be. The craving to destroy comes from thinking there is an existing thing that you now want to annihilate. Please understand the difference between annihilation and cessation. These are two different words chosen carefully by the Buddha. Annihilation means destroying something that is already there, a cheetah is the Pali word. Cheetah means to destroy, to cut something to bits. You can't cut what wasn't there to begin with, you can't destroy nothing. But the process, the empty process is different. The word for an empty process ceasing, for the whole universe to vanish, is Naroda. This is what you experience little by little little by little. In the Askatara Nikaya, the experience that the commentaries call the ninth jhana, asana. The deity Niruda, the cessation of all that is perceived and felt, that is, the cessation of the mind, is likened to Nibbana here and now by the Buddha. So this is what you can experience in this life, and it challenges all of your theories. You can see and understand the Yadama Hetapabhava Tesam Hetam Tathagato Aha. Whatever things come into existence, the Buddha taught the causes of that, and Tesam. K. Aniridhuivam Mahasama O, the great teacher also taught their cessation. You understand why that teaching was enough for someone who was as sharp as Venerable Sariputta to become a stream winner, and you understand why those words were inscribed on so many tablets in early Buddhism, so long ago. So, it is not something that has been changed by monks writing or meddling with the suttas, but one of the earliest pieces of Dhamma inscribed in stone and clay which we have today. They are probably the earliest written words of Dhamma that we have. 
available, beautiful teachings about cessation, the ending of everything. If you want something, if you want to be you, why only have suffering? When cessation happens, everything ends. Cessation happens. Everything ends. Cessation happens. Everything ends. Cessation happens.